Keep the door open. Okay. Do any students have announcements? Club things or things like that? Yes. Mountain Mike's? Yeah. Okay. okay. And you can eat pizza all day long? No, just from 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. Oh, 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. I thought you said 10 a.m. and I thought. <laughs> yes? The operas are starting um, this Thursday. The what? The opera. The opera. Um, And the opera is? It's um, three operas. It's called Suburbia. And it's three separate operas that kind of take place over a long span of time. They're all really good. And they're in English, so you can understand them. They're in English? They're in That's English. What more could you ask for? <laughs> OK, we're going to get started now. Um, the topic for today is the sociology of genocide. Oh, yes. I think it's very important. <laughs> Even though you all know Myrna Goodman, I want to introduce Myrna Goodman because she is incredible. I haven't known her that long, but she's incredible, an incredible person, an incredible scholar, and I have the honor of being mentored by her. So this is a great blessing uh, for all of us and for me. So the, just <laughs> Myrna Goodman. Very good, Daniel. You didn't forget a word. Okay. Um, I, I can hear a buzz. It's not coming from the microphone, but it's over there. Okay. Our topic for today is the sociology of genocide. Why, that'll put you in a mood, won't it? Um, the first thing I'm going to do is just give you a general introduction and then do a historical overview of genocide. You know, it didn't just start um, with our recent memory of uh, either the Holocaust or Rwanda. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the process of defining genocide and the influence of Raphael Lemkin in that process of defining it, and also talking to you about why it was so important to find a definition for genocide. Um, then I'm going to talk about the sociology of genocide and the social processes that are connected to the Holocaust, so that when we discuss genocide, it is always very helpful to have some sort of example that we can use to make sense of, sense of the different processes that go on. Um, and then we're going to see eight steps in understanding the process of genocide. And then I want to end with um, some words about what, what can be done, what can be done in the world that we live in. So this is a partial list of some of the genocides from um, both prehistory and also the 20th century. Unfortunately, we have to add the Sudan to the 21st century. But as you can see, uh, genocide goes back to 416 BC to the island state of Milos. Um, there were some early 13th century Catholics, the Cathars in France, that were subjected to genocidal action, and I'll talk a little bit about them, as well as the Christians of Japan, um, 
and also right in our own backyard, the Native, Cal the Native Americans of California. Um, the first genocide of the uh, 20th century was actually in South Africa, or Southwest Africa, in the German um, colony of Southwest Africa of a group of people called the Herreros. Um, then there were the Armenians. It's seemingly an endless list of genocides. The Ukrainians, which Steve Bittner told you about, the starvation that went on, the purposeful starvation that went on in the Ukraine in between World War I and II. Of course, there's the Holocaust, which is also known as the Shoah. You'll see Holocaust referred to by especially um, Jewish groups refer to it not as the Holocaust, but as the Shoah. And then um, towards the end of the century, East Pakistan, Cambodia, East Timor, Burundi, Rwanda, and Bosnia. There, we do not lack for um, examples of genocide. Uh, the Cathars were from early 13th century France. Um, as you can see, the crusade was aimed at them, and they were members of a Christian sect that created their own sacraments. And unlike previous movements that challenged the church or were heretical, uh, Catharism was a large and popular mass movement cent centered in the Languedoc region of France. So these people were uh, persecuted and murdered because of their beliefs and the way that their beliefs contradicted uh, the standing church. The Christians of Japan when Japan opened to the Western world and to the rest of the world, the first people there, of course, were Catholic missionaries, the people who also settled the Philippines and uh, uh, came to the Southwest in the United States. And, the, and they came and converted the Japanese to Catholicism. 285,000 of them were murdered in about a 30-year period. And this is a, an example of an entirely ideological genocide. The only reason the Catholics were murdered was because of their religion. Closer to home, we have issues of the um, genocide of Native Americans. And as you can see, over 150,000 Native Americans lived in California prior to the gold rush in 1849. By 1879, there was an estimated Native population of 31,000. So you can see that in a very short period of time, actually 30 years, there was less than one-third of the original population. Many Indians died of diseases, but they were also chased off their land, marched to the missions. How many of you have, I'll just ask this, you don't have to raise your hand, how many of you have been to the mission in Sonoma, where they refer to the servants' quarters, which is uh, rewriting history, shall we say. They weren't servants, uh, they were largely slaves. Um, they were enslaved and brutally murdered. And I mentioned in a couple of my sections, if not all of them, that the government of California awarded uh, you $10 if you brought the scalp of uh, a Native American to the government in Sacramento. $10 was a lot of money at, at the um, midpoint in the late 
eight, 19th century. Um, I guess it was a good way to make money. So we're not without our own culpability in this country. And this is just one example of one isolated genocidal situation. Then, of course, there is the Armenian genocide, which we will be learning more about as we move along. It was the first genocide of the 20th century. And uh, one million Armenians died because of massacres and forcible removals uh, during the government of the Unturks and a three-year period in the Ottoman Empire. The one thing that is um, unique about the Armenian Genocide is that it is remembered and commemorated every year in April. And every year, Armenians have to re-educate people to tell them about the Armenian Genocide. It is a most painful heritage that Armenians have today because every year they can't really entirely commemorate those people who were lost, but they have to spend that time trying to convince so many people that in fact the genocide did in fact happen. And it's very painful. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we have a an Armenian um, memorial lecture every year. Not so that we can uh, bypass the deniers, but so that we can remember and help Armenians remember. Well, now we move to the project of defining and classifying genocides. It's one thing to say, well, that was genocide. It's quite another to know the details of genocide and to also try to understand why we need to even worry about a definition of genocide. And I hope that'll be clear to you as we move along. Before the term genocide was actually coined, um, the way to describe mass death was they talked about barbarism and mass murder or mass death. Um, in the 19th and 20th century, uh, attempts um, included international treaties that aimed at preventing war crimes and crimes against humanity, barbarism, mass death, mass murder, crimes against humanity, And some of the things that were done to try and prevent um, or to understand legally what genocide was, one was the Geneva Conventions, which we hear about now. And those were essentially agreements between international, the international community about what was fair in war. How were captured soldiers treated? How were civilians to be treated? So the Geneva Convention was essentially uh, a way in which the, and I use the word advisedly, civilized countries of the world agreed on how they would carry out war. Um, kind of like the NBA rule book. Um, there were also uh, um, Various treaties at The Hague, where the International Co uh, World Court is now, but previously, which forbade, you know, were forbade the murder of POWs, non-combatants, or acts such as sinking, sinking passenger ships. So there were these t attempts to understand how um, the international community should um, describe some of the large-scale um, acts of violence against people. But what is the origin of the term genocide? You will be reading and you will know about Raphael Lemkin, who was uh, 
a jurist, a lawyer, and he first defined the term, which had come into common use, and it came into common usage after World War II. Um, I have some information about Lemkin. He is one of those people that you'll know about in history that remain remarkable and admirable. But the reason that there was a need for a term to describe um, the deliberate and systematic destruction of the European Jews, um, which was um, informed by the Armenian experience as well, is because you had to have a legal definition before you could take legal action. And in, and in law, you know, you had to spell out exactly what something was a violation of. The other reason there was this impetus to define genocide was that the total unique way in which the Germans went about murdering people was so abhorrent. It was not like mass murder or barbarism. It was something much more serious. And Lemkin, who was a Polish Jew, uh, who grew up and experienced pogroms, one of the words in your um, glossaries in your reader, systematic or random attacks against Jews. He watched people he knew murdered by Russian Cossacks rampaging through where he lived and in fact several times had to hide from those mobs. He was born in 1901 in eastern Polish, Poland. He was the son of a farmer, a Jewish farmer, but his mother was a very educated woman. And she saw to it that he was broadly educated. And so he went to schools and universities in Poland, Germany, and France. And when the Germans occupied Poland after the start of World War II in September of 1939, he fled Poland and came to the United States. He was unceasing in his pressure to make sure that the world community, now remember this was before the United Nations was formed, that the world community came up with some sort of laws against the kind of behavior that he was seeing. And he, in fact, was the one who um, framed and came up with the definition of genocide. Genocide, if we break it into its parts, geno comes from the word, the Greek word genos, which means birth, race of a similar kind. So people who were born of a similar background. And side from the French word sida, which means to cut or to kill. But the important thing that we really need to understand about why all of these definitions, and I'm going to be showing you some more, is that genocide has taken so many forms. If you define genocide simply by what happened to the Armenians, it becomes a term that doesn't work for other genocides. And so scholars have worked very hard to try and draft their own definitions, um, and it can get a little confusing. But if you just think in your mind that people are trying to specify what this term means um, and use Raphael Lemkin's definition as the one that you really should understand, you'll see that sociologists have, one, have a definition that's sociologically focused. Genocide is a form of one-sided mass killing in which a state or other authority intends to destroy a group as that group and membership in it are defined by the perpetrator.
See the elements in there? State-sponsored mass murder with the intent to destroy a group, not in part, but in whole. And that group has been defined not by itself, but by the perpetrator. And if you think about the Holocaust, um, you can see how that comes to be. There's a United Nations definition, and I didn't put it up there to uh, help you. Um, you can find it anywhere on the net, and I will put that link up. It's got three main articles. The first, and it was passed um, on the 9th of December, 1948, and Lemkin was alive long enough to see it passed. The, the contracting parties confirm that genocide, whether committed in time of peace or in time of war, is a crime under international law which they undertake to prevent and punish. Article 2. In the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethical, ethnical, racial, or religious group, such as killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life in calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. And it says in Article 3, the following acts should be punishable, genocide, conspiracy to commit genocide, direct and public incitement to commit genocide, attempting to commit genocide, and complicity in genocide. Now, I don't know how many of you are aware, but the International Court in The Hague has been holding trials and trying people who were responsible in Bosnia for some activities that fall under those definitions. As a sociologist, I am interested in sociologists' research interested in interest in genocide. What, what are the things that sociologists find important to know or understand? Well, we focus our, understand, our research to broaden our understanding of the specific details of genocidal acts and events. In that sense, we do comparative historical sociology. We do look at historical facts. We also seek to refine, re, refine various aspects of genocidal events by asking questions. That is the first thing that sociologists do. We ask questions. What are the, bless you, what are the dynamics and stages of genocide? How, do, how, does, how does it happen? Does it just break out or are there precursors to the um, acts of murder what are its conditions and causes? What causes genocide? Why? Why do we have genocide? And sociology also seeks to investigate, analyze, and generalize about the social phenomena connected to genocide. And by social phenomena, we talk about those interplays between individuals and also between large groups because that's what we study as sociologists. Well, the first thing we come up with is what are the motivations for genocide? Sociologists have come up with the notion that um, genocide um, <coughs> is done to eliminate a real or potential threat. 
This is perhaps the oldest form of genocide, starting with the development of agriculture and settlement, and this form was very common in antiquity. The second is to terrorize real or potential enemies, to scare the death out of them. This requires large armies and investment in occupation. Examples include the terror of Genghis Khan, Athens' murder of the men of Milos, Shaka Zulu's empire in South Africa, and the Soviet manufactured famine in the Ukraine. The third thing is genocide to acquire economic wealth. This type also was probably developed in antiquity. I think uh, of um, Genghis Khan and uh, the Mongols sweeping over Europe. And it's been associated with the settlement of the New World. We don't need to go that far back. Um, the colonial empires um, were definitely um, done to acquire economic wealth. And examples include the Pequots of New England, another case of uh, Native Americans, and the Herreros of Southwest Africa. The fourth is probably the one that, as a sociologist, interests me the most, and that is to implement a belief, a theory, or an ideology. And it is more recent in origin, and it differs from the first three in that the primary victims are members of the perpetrator state. They're not in some other country. And this is often carried out at great cost to the perpetrators. They're focusing, the Germans focused, the Nazis focused on ideology and not really the consequences of what they were doing. The expenditure of um, manpower, et cetera, was at great cost to them, this belief in creating a master race. And examples include the massacre of Turkish Armenians, the Holocaust, the Cambodian gen and the Cambodian genocide under Pol Pot. Sociologist Jack Newson Porter, who is also a survivor, um, using the Holocaust as an ideal type, and by ideal type we mean something that has within it all of the characteristics that we might imagine would be part of a genocide. Um, and he says the components are, in order to have, I guess we should think about um, uh, geno a genocide, we need to have technology, we need to have an ideology, there has to be a bureaucracy or an organization, and very, very important for us as sociologists, the social disintegration of the victims. Now, what do I mean by disintegration? That means separating people out from society. You've read enough now from uh, Bergen about the Holocaust to know how purposeful that disintegration was when it came to the Jews and also to the gypsies. Setting people aside, disintegrating them. Well, there's our favorite guy. Um, ideology. Well, ideology is a belief system. Anything that is a belief system can be described as an ideology. And ideology is used to justify and legitimize discriminatory acts against the victims. So the ideology of anti-Semitism was used. The ideology of the master race was used, just as two examples, and I am using examples from the Holocaust. So, perpetrators use ideology to render their victims isolated, powerless, vulnerable, and outside the universe of moral obligation. 
and I'll have more to say about that. But this is, for me, perhaps the most important summary idea that one can think about when one thinks about not only the Holocaust, but genocide. Setting people outside the universe of moral obligation. We're going to have fun because there were two versions of this on that flash stick, that flash drive. And we've got the old one here. OK. Bureaucracy. Many of you have had your own experience with a bureaucracy if you've ever tried to collect your financial aid if you've ever had to deal with the Department of Motor Vehicles. Well, the Holocaust had its bureaucracy, and it was composed of politicians and political leaders. There were top-level decision makers, military leaders, clerks, military personnel, guards, and, of course, ordinary people. Any genocide has its technology. And the te technology of, ga of uh, death can include shooting, gas, poison, starvation, experimentation, forced labor. In Rwanda, the most common weapon to kill 800,000 people in about a month was a machete. Absolutely, completely brutal, if you think about it. A machete, which were made in China, by the way, most of them. So let's talk about social disintegration of the victims of the Holocaust. There were five stages. First, definition of who was a Jew. Second, Jews were stripped of their livelihoods and their possessions. You've read about this now. Three, Jews were segregated from the larger population, disintegrated. Four, they were isolated from the rest of society in ghettos. And then they were concentrated in places and eventually murdered. At any point along the way, this could have stopped. Aha. The universe of moral obligation. Those of you who are sociologists or who have taken social theory know who Emil Durkheim was. And he talked about solidarity and moral obligation, and this idea comes from his idea. And the universe of moral obligation is defined as that circle of persons toward whom obligations are owed, to whom the rules apply, and whose injuries call for attention and healing kind of abstract, but think about what your own universe of obligation is. Who are you obliged to? Okay, let's talk about social actors and their roles during the Holocaust. They divide into four categories. There were victims, perpetrators, rescuers, and bystanders. The victims. Over one million children were part of the six million Jews murdered during the Holocaust. The Nazi victims also included, as you know now, Jehovah's Witnesses, Poles, 
Russian POWs, homosexuals, the Roma and the Sinti, communists, political opponents, and countless others. 13 million and about 20 million Soviet citizens. Who are the perpetrators? Well, we have Adolf Hitler. Nothing would have happened without him, but as I have been given to tell you, he was the leader but he was not the supreme perpetrator. Perpetrators actually got their hands dirty, as it were. Himmler in the middle. And uh, someone who was killed rather early in the war, Heydrich. Uh, he is the one, if you haven't learned about it yet, who called the Vansi Conference so that they could decide in 1943 what Jews were left to kill, especially the ones in Western Europe. There were the desk murderers, the people who calmly sat at their desks and sent trains to Auschwitz without any notion that they could stop what they were doing. They just went ahead and did it. And they're called desk murderers. I would suggest to you that we probably still have desk murderers at work in the Pentagon. Willing executioners, people who were sent to the east. Um, you can see this man standing on top of uh, a pit. There are bodies in it. And the fellows all along, especially the ones on the right-hand side, look as though they're smirking or laughing. I've seen enough pictures of the victims to realize that those smiles may not reflect joy. They may, in fact, reflect a certain kind of discomfort. There's no way for us to know. There were compliant killers. Those of you who are interested in that aspect of the Holocaust might want to read Christopher Browning's Ordinary Men, which is um, an analysis of the trial of some middle-aged men who formed Battalion 101 that was sent into Poland to round up Jews and do the very thing that you saw those men standing around the pit doing. My own interest in the Holocaust came up against a, a wall. And I finally said to myself, I can't do this anymore. I cannot think that the world is a place where all of these evil people live. And I read a very short piece in a book. If you're interested, I'll tell you what it was. About Denmark. And those of you who know me or have talked with me know that I have studied Denmark during the war because it was an exception that all of the Jews who were in Denmark, be they Danish citizens or not, were to an overwhelming percent shipped across the water to Sweden in a national effort. And it was when I learned about that, when I learned of, that there were people who were not evil, who were in fact rescuers, that my own perspective on who I could be, who we could be, shifted dramatically. We have in the past had New Dibe come and visit us. He is typically Danish. Um, he was a policeman during, uh, a Danish policeman during the war, and he personally brought Jews from the interior of Denmark 
to the coastal towns and put them on fishing boats so that they could be saved. Um, he's been honored as a righteous person by the Holocaust Memorial Authority in Israel called Yad Vashem. You should know that there are righteous persons from every European country, including Japan, because there was a Japanese diplomat who issued visas to Jews in Poland and Lithuania. His name was Sugihara. Those people have been honored as righteous persons. And there are trees planted in their name um, in the Grove of the Righteous in Israel. So it was people like Daibi who made me realize that we all could be different. He was just an ordinary policeman who, when someone said, I wonder if you could help me get this package to the harbor, who knew exactly what was being said and asked of him, said, of course without question. The last category of people um, that I want to talk about are bystanders. And bystanders were ordinary people who did not act. They complied with the laws, tried to avoid getting involved in doing anything wrong, And most just wanted to get along with their lives. Uh, during the Holocaust, the collective world's response toward the murder of millions of people was minis minimal. So one might say as a nation, the United States was a bystander nation. Elie Wiesel, who's been in the news of late, has said that he, he, he on some level can understand why someone might be a perpetrator he certainly understands how people became victims. And he says, I wish there were more rescuers, but am grateful for them. But the people that I despise, the people who it is so hard to forgive are the bystanders, people who could have done something. which brings us once again to the universe of moral obligation. Who, who are we responsible for? And I don't mean it in some broad manner, you know, you know, broad brush. We need to think close and to move outward. Who do we feel responsible for? Is it just ourselves and our immediate family? Increasingly in our, in our society, that's the case. Our circle of obligation is drawing closer and closer and closer to us. OK. We're going into the home stretch here. So let's try and understand the genocidal process. I've kind of described to you the general um, processes, but let's try and understand the genocidal process. And I am working here with some ideas that were created by uh, Dr. Gregory Stanton at Genocide Watch. And included in some of the things I'm going to say are, are some of the things that he suggests we need to do to prevent genocide. He says that there are eight elements of genocide. Classification, uh, I'm going to go through them one by one. Symbolization, dehumanization, organization, polarization, preparation, extermination, and that the last stage of genocide is denial. So genocide is a process that develops 
in stages. They're predictable but not inevitable. As each stage, um, at each stage, preventative measures can halt the process. The later stages are always preceded by the earlier ones, but the early ones continue to operate through the whole process. So let's look at the first one, which is classification. All cultures have categories to distinguish people into us and them. When you read James Waller, you'll see how that process takes place and how universal it is. We divide people by ethnicity, by race, religion, or nationality. German and Jew, Hutu and Tutsi. These bipolar societies, like us, in some level, white and black, especially ones that m lack mixed categories like Rwanda and Burundi, are the most likely to have genocide. The main preventative measure is to create a sense of what? A sense of humanity. That it's not us and them, that it's us. The second um, step is symbolization. What you see there is a, well, it's something that allows people to move about, a movement pass. Uh, it's got a big J on it. What do you think that J means? Jew. Jew. Uh, those are passports. Big J on it. Did the Germans come up with that? No. The people who came up with the idea of putting a, a J identifying Jews on a passport were the Swiss. Because lots of Jews were trying to get out of Germany and coming to Switzerland. And they didn't want all of those German Jews mucking up Swiss society. So they said, to the Germans, just, just put a J on their path, you know, their passport, and we'll know they're Jews and we can turn them away. So you know that we 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 give names things to names to things that we classify. We call people Jews, we call them gypsies. Classification and symbolization are universally human actions. You'll find that out again when you read Waller. And they do not necessarily result in genocide unless they had, they lead to the next stage, which is dehumanization. This is a depiction of a Jew on the cover of a book, I think. You can see on the one hand, he is cradling a cutout of the Soviet Union which leads one to believe he's a communist. And on the other hand, he's got gold, which would lead you to believe he's a capitalist. And um, the German at the bottom is the eternal Jew. In this process of dehumanization, one group denies the humanity of the other group. And members of it are equated with animals, vermin, insects, or diseases. We've talked in my sections about the linguistic um, devices that were used by the Nazis, how they talked about extermination. Um, they also used... Um, a lot of language that covered, but they talked about dirty Jews. They equated Jews with rats and vermin. Well, that was all in the process of dehumanization. 
And what that dehumanization does is it overcomes our natural revulsion against violence. One of the things that Christopher Browning concluded after studying the records of this trial was that the men who killed, shot women and children and elderly men and young boys, just like the one that described to you what happened to his father, had been so indoctrinated for so many years about how worthless Jews were, that it was not difficult to pull the trigger. That in fact they were doing the world a favor by getting rid of all of these Jews, be they little children or women or elderly people. Um, you need organization. Oops. Hmm. Two great slides missing. In any case, you need organization. Genocide is always organized, usually by the state, though sometimes informally. Okay, and this would have been a slide of a whole bunch of SS. The next step is polarization. And in polarization, um, extremists drive groups apart. And hate groups begin broadcasting polarizing propaganda. You remember the sign that said, Jews are not wanted here? That would be an example of that. And then this is an example of identification. Victims are systematically identified and separated out because of their ethnic or religious identity. This is actually a chart, you can buy the poster at the Holocaust Museum, of all of the various markings that people wore on their clothes, you know. Um, you can see those special ones down at the bottom. Race defilers. Those were people who had sexual relations with Jews. Um, you can see the pink triangles for the, um, they even marked uh, homosexual Jews. The habitual criminals wore green. The political prisoners had red, as if to indicate the Soviet Union. And then, of course, there was the notorious yellow star. Some people believe um, or have heard that in Denmark, The king wore a yellow star to mark his solidarity with his people. It's not true. But people tell the story as a way of kind of reminding us that the people of Denmark did have solidarity, not only with Jewish Danes, but with Jews living in Denmark. And there were a lot of them who were not citizens. Um, classifying people. I thought you might find this interesting because of Lucille's um, association with the Loge Ghetto. If you Google Loge Ghetto, you can really get a lot of information about what the ghetto was like, including these images. Um, I almost thought that woman in the black coat on the other side of the street almost looked like her. But I guess that was my mind playing games. The last step is extermination. Um, this is a crematorium adjacent to the gas chamber in Auschwitz. This is in Auschwitz I. 
not Birkenau, which was Auschwitz too. And it was preserved, but in uh, Birkenau, um, the, both of the gas chambers and the crematoria were blown up. One in an insurrection and the other by the Germans as they retreated. But the last stage is denial. The Holocaust is a gigantic Zionist hoax. It's a lie. Not surprising that the people who are dressed up there are Ku Klux Klan. This is the last stage. In fact, um, towards the end of the genocide, people will dig up the evidence and try and hide it um, in an attempt to cover up what they had done. They intimidate witnesses. They deny that they have committed any crimes and often blame what happened on the victims. It's happened in almost every... Holocaust that we know of in the 20th century. It's especially galling with the Armenian genocide because it is so far distant in history. It's really hard for us to make any kind of evaluation. The Holocaust is more difficult for deniers to not appear to be out of their minds, which I believe they are, because there is so much evidence so much testimony, so many records, so much evidence. Um, but the last step is denial. Samantha Powers wrote a book called The Problem from Hell, America and the Age of Genocide. You will be reading a few passages from that book, a few chapters. And what she says in there is that we as a, the American government has been a complete failure in stopping any of these genocides. And she analyzes why she thinks that's the case. And she reminds us that intolerance and indifference are a most lethal pair of foes. And she says that it's imperative that we attend to the current situation in Darfur. Not in that book, but in an essay she wrote for Time magazine. Because it is a region on the edge of genocide. I have been hearing about Darfur as a, something where there is a genocide watch from the Committee on Conscience. And now we believe a full-blown genocide is going on. The difference, there are really people taking a stand. And in fact, the college organization that is working actively against to raise awareness is called STAND. This was taken in a refugee camp in Chad. How many of you have seen Hotel Rwanda? That's how many of you found out about it because it occurred, the genocide occurred in 1994. So you can kind of say, well, I found out about that in a movie. The movie about Darfur is, and the Sudan is playing now. It hasn't even been written yet. And I found that most interesting. So what can you do? Can you do anything? Is there a call to your conscience? Well, you can go to the United States Holocaust Museum and just put in conscience. Um, you can also go to savedarfour.org. You can get involved with the Human Rights Club at Sonoma State. They're uh, tabling, selling t-shirts. They'll be here um, when our speaker on Rwanda comes. You can
spread the word. Usually in the fall, I say to my students, you know, when you go home for Thanksgiving, you can ruin everybody's dinner by telling them what's happening in the Sudan. So now it's Easter dinner you can ruin. Um, I know many of you talk with your parents and tell them about some of the things that we're learning about here. Um, people have very busy lives. And we're not too fond of the mainstream media, which has, to a certain extent, covered this. But we need to do it word of mouth. They're not going to do it for us. And we need to think about this. What is our universe of moral obligation? Am I suggesting that all of you go... Uh, can I have the light? Can I? Am I suggesting that all of you drop everything and go to the Sudan next week? No. But I'm asking you just the same things I ask myself. What little bit can I do? Because it's not going to make a big difference. Unless you're a very unusual person, it can't make a big difference. But if we all did just a tiny little bit, we might make some difference. So I talked to you about the sociology of genocide. And sure, there are a lot of facts for you to know so that you understand how genocide happens. But for me, the end part is to say, this is your challenge. To do some little bit We'll be raising money in here in a few weeks for orphanages in both Rwanda and in Darfur. Tell somebody you know about it. Tell your parents. And they'll surely say, don't invite them again. Right? We don't want to hear any of that sad stuff. But did you know that Brittany shaved her head? Okay, that's, that's it for today. I will post the PowerPoint to the section Daniel will do the same with his. Any questions?